I V M. A hundred bucks. That's all it takes to begin your journey with Bitcoin and Ethereum. No, really. With Coin Switch, you can start investing in over a hundred cryptocurrencies with just hundred rupees. On top of that, there are zero charges for deposits and withdrawals, so you can trade, buy, sell, however and whenever you want. All of this, plus their extremely intuitive interface, makes Coin Switch the perfect app for beginners in the crypto space. But don't take my word for it. Just download Coin Switch for free and try it out for yourself. If you'd like more information on cryptocurrencies, tune into a show about crypto with me, Rohan Joshi, my new adventure on IBM Podcasts. Coin Switch, kuch to badlega. Hello and welcome to an episode of Simplified. Welcome yeah, you to- know, uh, I just realized that the uh, podcast <laughs> is the one place where the clap yeah. happens bef- just before we start speaking. <laughs> 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 what Tony is referring to, of course, is no. What was uh, half half Nelson was one one one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what Tony is referring to, of course, is that when we start, uh, uh, ah, okay. just like how in uh, something the movies they a say three two one and then they have the. Uh, clapper. Clapper. <laughs> clapper. Is that, oh, it's called a clapper. It's called oh, a clapper. Yeah. Called. Wow. Did not know all these things. Learning so much already <laughs> and we haven't even started the episode proper. So, uh, today uh, we are going to talk <laughs> about China, which who, must, who we must be eternally grateful to because they have provided podcast topics for such a long time. Like after the obsolescence of Donald Trump, which... Feels like such a relief. Uh, yeah. China is doing one thing after the other, which gives us endless fodder for simplified. So we're going to talk a little bit about them today. So I came uh, uh, and my family <laughs> WhatsApp group delivered yeah, brilliantly yeah, yeah. yesterday with the China related. Of course, uh, he's yeah. on a profundity. Okay? That's so, almost the okay, only here's thing. The thing. Um, in yeah. this day of wokeness and all that, you have to double think before you make any joke, right? And to some extent. I miss that old Kushwan Singh stereotype type jokes to some extent. Like those are innocent times mm. it feels like. Now you have to double think who is going to get offended. Is this correct and uh, all that. So it was a relief to re- to uh, to read the pseudo Kushwan Singh joke that I got. It's not exactly a profundity but it segues quite nicely and you guys know exactly what this is going to be. A Chinese man came to Kerala. He took a taxi at Kochi airport on his oh way by seeing God. a bus. Yes, exactly. It's one of those. He told the, cha- he told yeah. the taxi driver that in Kerala buses run very slow. In China buses run very fast. After some time he came near a railway bridge and saw a train passing over the bridge. Then the Chinese man told the driver the trains run very slow here in China, trains run very fast. Throughout the journey, he complained to the driver disparaging Kerala. However, the taxi driver kept mum through the journey. When the Chinese man reached his destination, he asked the driver what the meter reading and taxi fare they are on. The taxi driver replied, it is 10,000 rupees. The Chinese was shell-shocked after hearing the taxi where he shouted, are you kidding in your country? Buses run slow, trains run slow, everything runs slow. How come the meter alone runs fast? To this taxi bro, this word is used. To which the taxi bro reply calmly, Sir, the meter is made in China. Oh, <laughs> morning over here. <laughs> Check me. Oh, wow. I wonder why Kerala was chosen. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm pretty sure this is customized to whichever family. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, to, it's to manage the communist shock. Uh, <laughs> like yeah. even in a communist state, it's yeah. like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Go no, ahead, Tony. You were saying. No, no, I was just saying, like, uh, the, like it has words like disparaging and all in yeah. a family forward. Which yeah. Is like, yeah. Uh, no, I'm most surprised about taxi bro. <laughs> <laughs> How taxi driver suddenly got elevated to taxi bro is uh, quite This is like uh, rejects from Shashi Tharoor family. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or Shashi Tharoor himself. Yeah. <laughs> no, the so it's dumbing it down point. for the... Yeah, <laughs> yeah this, this actually makes me feel like, uh, which, which something, I mean, after uh, having spent five years analyzing different types of WhatsApp forwards, I feel a lot of these forwards are constructed in parts by different people. You know, like uh, the first it's part like of Wikipedia have, is like a crowd. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's very much so. Like someone edits a little bit. Like the first part was written by a traditional old WhatsApp uncle, and then over the period huh. of time, like he died while writing the foreword and then his son took over. <laughs> so, so then he wrote Taxi Bro so, and like and stuff like that. So it's, it's you see the entire, you see generations passing through the entirety of the, through the duration of the foreword. 
So do you think like eventually these WhatsApp, I think the only thing left is for these WhatsApp forwards to be sold as NFTs. <laughs> yeah. 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 Just yesterday, I'm yeah. not sure if you guys saw, just yesterday as of the date of recording, uh, which is 6th August. Uh, 7th the, August. Huh? No, as in yesterday was oh. 6th August. The sentence construction issue there. Uh, that that uh, Pakistani meme is there. No, This guy broke up with oh, this Oh, yeah. Guy. Yes. Oh, that, that, that original is meme got sold for 51,000 USD for 20 yeah. Ethereum. What, uh, because what? because those guys got back together. No, that's yeah, yeah they... those guys got back together almost <laughs> immediately, actually. What? Yeah. Oh, it was no, Naren did not know this. What meme was this? Okay, oh. so this... Naren, if you have not seen this, okay. Uh, let's, he has, he let's, has. You just need to refresh his memory. Yeah, so this, um, it's, it's this delightful meme of, you know, two Pakistani guys uh, clasping hands with very badly... MS mm. painted text all over it. Word art types. Word art, word, word art, art. Yeah, very, yeah. very. No, not MS yeah. paint. Yeah, uh-huh. uh, which is uh, um, the uh, like the, uh, this guy has broken up with friendship with Mudasar. Mudasar now. has uh, broken up. So uh, I'm sending it to Narin as of now on <laughs> chat. So if you want to see it, you can see it over there. Everybody else, uh, I'm assuming you've seen this. Friendship ended with Mudasir. Now Salman is my best friend. With uh, I assuming Salman, Mr. Salman, his uh, image has been cancelled out. And this became a meme on Twitter, I think 2015 or 16. Yeah, 2015. And this ended up becoming popular meme like uh, oh. this like BJP has broken up with this something like that and then you know, oh, okay. BCCI mm. has broken up with this cricketer you know it, it spawned all sorts of things okay yeah, yeah but uh, basically at that point NFTs weren't there and now recently there was a, a like post very senti post by uh, you know these guys uh, Mudasar and the other guy saying how they are best friends for life and suddenly Ooh. this old thing crept up and sold for yeah. 50,000 plus US dollars. So, wow. yeah. But, yeah. but I, I feel, I mean, uh, in, in pure Indian uh, memes, I think the top two NFTs that would go is, uh, the number one would be uh, India uh, India's national anthem being selected by UNESCO. That has to yeah. be number one. Yeah. And number two has to be uh, uh, NASA's view of Diwali. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, actually, if you're able to find the original ones of these, I would pay money for that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's what, like, these are these are cultural artifacts. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but also, this uh, disappointed Park fan, you know that meme, right? From the oh, cricket yeah. world. Yeah, 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 yeah. He is now, uh, I think, featured in a museum. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, he's on LinkedIn and stuff. Like, I saw yeah. it. No, he, he is, but now he's become like a me, uh, like an installation in some museum and stuff. That yeah, in Hong Kong. In Hong yeah. Kong, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a meme museum in Hong Kong and he's in it and stuff. Yeah. So, it's uh, it's amazing. There's a uh, meme museum in Hong Kong. It, it, that, that place <laughs> surprises me. It's like, it, it. there are two different Hong Kongs that exist. No, yeah. I'm, my, my biggest concern is, that place does not have place for people. They built a meme museum in the middle of it. Like there <laughs> is no people space. Are, I mean, they're, they're effectively taking care of the population problem right now. Also, yeah. and, let, and let's use that to segue back let's, to yeah, Hong Kong's uh, <laughs> overlords, which is China. <laughs> which yeah. is uh, China. So, so recently, China's government has been cracking down on a few sectors, causing you know all sorts of. Uh, people to get spooked, all sorts of industries worrying whether they will be next and all that. So I wanted to talk about that a little bit and just generally discuss it with you intelligent people. Firstly, uh, before we do that though, uh, since Tony has moved back to uh, Bombay for, so this is the first time in, if you plot the geolocations of all the simplified hosts, for the first time we have a straight line before it used to be a triangle on Google Maps if you plot. I don't know why I said that. I just uh, <laughs> I have the screenshot of Google Maps over here and one triangle starting Bombay, Kochi and of course Kuala Lumpur. We are an international <laughs> show. Okay, so the chronology of things in November 2020, okay, uh, as we know China uh, has a lot of um, Chinese internet exists in its own sort of uh, uh, its own bubble. Lots of huge companies like Alicent, uh, no, uh, yeah, Alibaba, oh. Tencent rather, <laughs> Alicent <laughs> and uh, a nice. whole lot of others. Used a lot by Chinese and now with ByteDance's TikTok taking over the social media world, they're expanding, so etc, etc. And 
it's been a thriving sector. Lots of it's been in the news and at least people who work in marketing and internet, etc. We look towards China sometimes because a lot of trends happen over there. Um, so it, it, it's a thriving sort of economy which sometimes the rest of the world does not really know about because it's completely in Chinese, it operates completely differently, etc. Now, what happened interestingly last year, November 2020, is the Chinese government, which till now seems to have been quite friendly with this tech sector, they blocked the IPO for Ant Financial, which was of course founded by Alibaba's uh, founder and uh, billionaire, Jack Ma, who is one of the most admired business people in China. That for the first time, something like this ever happened and that sent a few ripples along the global community saying, well, okay, the government's done something uh, as huge as this. What was scarier after that was uh, Jack Ma was summoned to a meeting with the government and then disappeared for weeks. It's a little scary. Then in April 2021, this year, uh, a few antitrust actions happened against huge, uh, including huge fines against Alibaba, Tencent, Baidu, which is their equivalent of Google. Then the true blow happened when China's equivalent of Uber, which is Didi or Didi, not quite sure how that's pronounced. So just a single day after their IPO in the US, $73 billion ka IPO, government regulators barred it from app stores completely. It's it's almost like China was go- deliberately going after all of these guys and then everybody started quivering in their boots wondering what's next, who is next, etc. And we found out who's next. In July 21, uh, the Chinese government announced that edtech has to, or education has to be non-profit. So all the edtech firms, their shares crashed. Uh, and incidentally, they are also doing it to offline institutes and just a couple of days before our recording here on Simplified, the Chinese government said that gaming is like opium for the mind um, as opposed (laughs) to the other kind, I suppose. You you can have opium for your toe. For the toe, specifically for the toe. I I think you actually might. Uh, Driving down shares of Tencent and other Chinese firms. So basically, from over the last six, seven months or so, the government has had a very antagonistic stance against uh, the so-called big tech Chinese firms. Stocks obviously have been battered. Investors are spooked. And... I'm wondering if the average Chinese person is exactly saying, yeah, that will show those companies and all that. So that is what the chronology is like. So, um, yeah, um, yeah so open for discussion. Chinese uh, Chinese are totally badass. So when, when I was growing up, uh, everything was fine. And we were all watching uh, movies where Jitendra danced and uh, Rajesh Khanna did songs. And all of a sudden came Enter the Dragon, right? And so Enter the Dragon was a revolution. Yeah, this badass Chinese guy, like titch of a guy, mm. kicking big guys and everything. And that was a big hit. Enter the Dragon, Bruce Lee was a huge hit. And that started, I think, in the... Uh, like So th- th- back in the day, there used to be this... Uh, you know, everything used to be on on videotape. So you had these, uh, you know, everything was video cassettes, and you had these enormous, like you know, just just rush of uh, Chinese movies, where you would have, you know, all kinds of. I think Jackie Chan also makes an appearance in, mm. in that generation. So you have something called a snake in monkey shadows. So this guy looks at a snake, and another guy looks at a monkey, and they are fighting, and then these guys <laughs> figure out how to fight, and. I was completely amazed. So I was young at that time and I was like, how the hell is China not like the number one, two and three in the world? Because those, like you would have people making weapons out of hairpins, out of uh, <laughs> fans, out of out of anything. Like like a shawl and then this lady, like she had a shawl, a shawl or a scarf and she would be beating the heck out of uh, a bunch of bad guys. So China is, uh, you know, doing that kind of thing uh, in uh, in in real life now. So it's it's using everything, ed tech, gaming, anything as weapons to kick. kick everyone up. Yeah, but the, yeah, so, the the weird thing is, he's kicking its own ass in some ways. So yeah, uh, yeah. sorry, Tony. No, I was just saying it's basically like you know these companies are married to the Chinese government and yeah. from martial arts now they've moved to marital arts. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They want to have more kids. Like, go, go, do 
Yeah. No, no. I mean, it's it's basically like a fight between spouses, right? So uh, you clearly know who's going to get the way there, and it's going to be the Chinese government. Uh, but I mean, overall, uh, it, it's like you know, China is extremely important for business when uh, someone like Mark Zuckerberg is fluent in speaking Mandarin, right? So yeah, uh, so that's because his wife is Chinese. <laughs> oh, okay. I mean, uh, I, I that's the I mean that's, that's the, the PR party line. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> but Shriket, as our Chinese correspondent, uh, as in like Very you're nice. a correspondent yeah, about yeah. China and not closest, you are not yeah. Chinese. Geographically uh, closest, geographically main, closest, yeah. and uh, possibly ideologically most aligned. Also, I have seen <laughs> Chairman Mao's <laughs> book next to you when you sleep sometimes. So, I, what do you think about? <laughs> I I don't know if you guys are familiar with the. So I I, I made very sure, but there is somewhere on the internet. And a, a video of me speaking for a full two minutes in Chinese. Oh, oh. <laughs> so, we shall uh, we shall find this. Yeah, so uh, no, I I spent a good part of last year uh, learning Mandarin. Oh, uh, but uh, no, I mean it was it was a big failure because I learned it for about four months and learned to, to do my introduction and say that my wife is pretty and stuff like that. Oh. Uh, but uh, yeah, who, who but, was teaching you? Uh, I took classes like Mandarin classes like uh, there was a pro- teacher coming and teaching us that till the lockdown didn't happen she used to teach in person and then she started teaching on Zoom so uh, but yeah it's, it, it was it's, it is incredibly a difficult language to learn and actually the interesting part is how uh, through that language also uh, you find out how I mean the, when you learn a language you also learn a lot about the culture mm. and uh, the very interesting thing that I found, which is linked to this, when you learn country names in China, right, uh, in, in China, in Mandarin, these are like, you think about the different countries like Japan. Uh, so Han Guo is uh, China, is Nuon Guo is uh, Japan. I'm, I'm, I'm screwing it up. I don't remember it very well. But all the, all the big, so Guo is used for a big country, right? It's a large country. So they have uh, Korea is a large country. Japan is a large country. The US is a large country. So they have Go at the end of it, right? But it, it, you also find the hierarchy because countries like India, even though they were massive in size and they have had trading links with China since ages, is not a Go. Oh, so so they are uh, so uh, in Inti Inti is India. There's no Go, right? And uh, so similarly, a l- lot of large countries, countries in Africa, none of them are Go. There is a very implicit hierarchy which comes through in language, and that gets kind of expressed in uh, in the language itself. And when you when you look at like how imposition of their rules comes through, there is also like that that attitude of monopolization. Now, now actually, the the, the new attitude that's coming through is that it's almost like no other country other than China is a guo is a is a large country where we now set the direction of that. Uh, so if you see, China used to be insulated, then they started moving to this place, like, let's ma- rapidly get get on par with the country. And now that they've come into a position of leading the world, they are like uh, uh, reversing back to the first stage where they're like, now we will impose our own rules mm-hmm. and re- regulations because we are now the world leader. We will dictate. Like like the US never had to change its cultural norms to adjust to anyone. Yeah. Else. They dictated their culture to the world, right? And that's how I I almost see this as uh, China's moment to start dictating its cultural, start setting its own cultural norms and uh, rules without being apologetic about it. Oh, that, that's wow. fascinating what you said. I, I yeah. genuinely did not know about that language thing. So do they review language then? Suppose like they are in great relation. Suppose like tomorrow India and China become best of friends. Then do, do we get elevated to go <laughs> status or will we be forever duo status? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I, I think the language is pretty much, uh, was has been pretty much set in stone since I think the 15th century or something. So whatever was, uh, but uh, which is interesting because Obviously, the United States did not exist back then. Yeah. But when they did set it up, now obviously I didn't get enough time to look into that. But when it did get set, it automatically got ascended to that Go status because yeah. of its uh, superiority in some way. So obviously, the language must be evolving. But uh, I doubt uh, just uh, slightly closer relationship in trade and like getting some favorable 
I don't think Pakistan can give any amount of Belt and Road, and they will be elevated to a go status. <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, that, no, that's uh, that's true, and that's uh, that's quite interesting. Okay, so I I'll come back to this. Um, uh, you know, on this particular topic, what are the reasons for China to uh, the Chinese government rather to do this? So some people are saying is because of data security issues. Others are saying you know is to increase competition. but most likely it is the that the paranoid chinese communist party uh, ccp just wants stability and they are okay sacrificing so called growth and investor friendliness to show that they are you know the boss so they're clamping down on billionaires and suddenly now all the billionaires in china across sectors are damn scared uh, and they don't know whether they are going to be next because these guys what they're doing are they're not wiping out companies they're wiping out entire sectors just like that uh, right. which is uh, one way that this current clampdown is very different from say the antitrust actions that have happened in the united states like the us has gone after companies like standard oil and microsoft in the past but those are individual con- uh, companies like when uh, they uh when when they ruled against microsoft it's not like the entire tech sector suffered as a result but now over here the everybody in the space of edtech for instance uh and now gaming etc and the entire China internet economy as a whole pretty much pissing in the pants um, yeah, but edtech at least has i mean you can argue from the cultural standpoint yeah yeah so that, yeah i was just getting i was I, i'll just get to that in a bit i think that's kind of interesting and to some extent i actually agree with it's a weird thing is i actually same thing, get yeah. the point of view yeah i i yeah. understand uh, like why they're doing at least uh, i was seriously like thinking of getting a xi jinping t-shirt and you know yeah, yeah, right, <laughs> yeah. i love xi tattooed on my forearm yeah yeah, yeah. yeah so uh I, I, before we before we get to you know that sector that specific sector people say the ccp the the party is scared because suddenly for the first time with social media you have like a generation of people with their voice so uh, uh, they want to make sure that they have control over this and to some extent and here's where the i guess the nicer part is it, it really is that they're worried about the us style inequality like that's something that's making news yeah. in the us these days right so much like uh, especially with you know billionaires like bezos and elon musk having such pay disparity from the lowest workers uh, and you know all the things about inequality that's come out and to some extent that has happened in china as well where there are problems with their uh, delivery drivers and uh, all that another interesting point that i saw uh, that i saw somewhere and this might interest uh, uh, narin specifically because you work in that sort of industry the some people are say that chinese businesses and cultures are biased towards manufacturing hardware and physical goods and yeah. uh, fundamentally as a culture they're against uh the cloud based or the so called immaterial goods created by software and financial industries for, and the examples that i've seen somewhere is like huawei for instance is it still has government support uh the government is spending a lot in semiconductors like we discussed a couple of episodes back gene technology and artificial intelligence that still involves a fair bit of hardware so it's kind of interesting actually that is happening right now especially in the light of the china versus usa that cold tech war that's happening you would think that china would go all in supporting its own versions of google and social networks and e-commerce and all that but it's interesting they're clamping now so that way i admire that they're standing by some principles that they have one thought that so i've been reading a lot about this just to try and get various view points so when i saw this first for the first time i was like yeah i mean this is a very stupid thing to do and to some extent i still believe that but the more i read about it like when i started reading about the inequality and what china actually wants to do the more i think is actually reasonably a good strategic sort of decision uh, to make because one thought that i read somewhere is uh, to to be a great power you don't need social networks and things like that i saw the scathing analysis by one china analyst called dan wang and yes that is uh, uh, that is his uh, name stops me correct uh, stop praising unproductive industries that take people away from more meaningful industries and i thought that was fantastic because i've been thinking the same thing about the us for so long like there was this one beautiful quote a few years back where somebody said the best minds of my generation are uh, teaching people how to click on ads so that's kind of fascinating that china deliberately wants people to go back to the industries that is going to actually make it a superpower like it's worth remembering that during world war 2 america became a superpower because it invested so much in manufacturing and not necessarily mm. virtually connecting people to each other so it's kind of interesting uh, we'll take a break over here before because we've like we've spoken so much but uh, this is nice quote that i'll 
kind of uh, uh, end with after the cold war our priorities our being the uh, our being uh, the us shifted from survival to enjoyment technologies like facebook and amazon which are fundamentally about leisure and consumption went from being fun and profitable spin offs of de- defense efforts to center to the center of what americans thought of as tech and so very clearly china and its uh, the supporters of this sort of uh, crackdown say that yeah it's time to stop thinking about tech as uh, something that is so easily scalable and all that and they start talking about actual manufacturing it's kind of interesting when you think about it that way so yeah Sorry, yeah. I've just been reading a lot about this. Yeah. So I have a few quotes and things that I put in. Yeah. Take a little bit of a break and then we will come back and uh, let the others talk and shut up. Yeah. Hey, it's been another great week on the IBM Podcast Network. On Pesa Vesa, Anupam talks to Siddharth Mehta, CEO and MD of Free Charge. They discuss buy now, pay later, neobanks, and a whole lot more. On our new show, The Longest Constitution, hosted by Priya Mirza, we look at what it actually has to say about things we come across in our daily lives. In our first episode, we touch upon adultery laws and why they treat men and women differently. Say No to Drama with Chetna kicks off with an episode on dating apps. Along with Saisha and Kunal, we celebrated Cyrus's birthday with a bunch of listener questions, birthday traditions, and a whole lot more. On the note, journalist Kavri Banzai discusses her new book, The Three Khans, and how they see their Muslim identity. Do follow us on social media, where IBM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And remember, if you're enjoying this show or any other show for that matter, please do tell a friend. That's really helpful for us. And finally, we'd like to thank the sponsors on the network this week, Siet Cred, Bank of Baroda, Intuit India, and CoinSwitch Kuber. We really do appreciate the support. Welcome back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so uh, during the break, I was just checking on, you know, the income inequality in China and it has nothing to do with tech, right? It's always been there. And ever since they've been in the market economy. Uh, and as of 2012, their Gini coefficient, which is what measures income inequality, was at 0.5 or something. So it is pretty, and that number is actually disputed by, uh, you mm. know, actual experts saying it's much higher. So all of this basically is bullshit to, you know, basically clamp down on anyone who the uh, Communist Party thinks is a threat. Uh, either culturally or you yeah. know ha- can cause disruption yeah. yeah can cause disruption maybe 10 years down the line right so, so they just want to words. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And mm. and basically Dan Wang or whoever it is is probably the Op India equivalent of China because <laughs> most of their I mean only the Op India equivalent of China gets to exist there, right? As a as a medium Fair, of communication. Yeah. And I I mean there is a certain amount of exotic oriental versus western dichotomy that we like to play out. But mm-hmm. I mean the fact of the Mac matter is we are in 2021 uh, where distances across the world have been flattened and you basically you know can connect with anyone irrespective of uh, Mm. language or culture or any of those things right so it is to my mind absolutely mind-boggling that such a monolith like China can exist in 2021 and you know there can be uh, a conversation around defending such a model Mm -hmm. just because of the so-called evils of capitalism in, in America and the consumer economy, right? So, yeah. Sorry for well, the rant. I'll, just I'll, I'll be very honest. I didn't expect you to take a contrarian stance. On this. It's fascinating. <laughs> so, we actually have something to talk so about I'll, over here. I, I, have, I have my uh, sort of two bits on this. So, uh, you know, as, as uh, Shri Ket will agree, all, all Sapiens fans know that uh, since the beginning of civilization, it's all been about privileged few controlling the activities and yeah. uh, efforts of many. It's a, it's a view of some people that uh, the Enlightenment uh, movement that started in Europe in the 1700s and that gave rise to ideas like liberty, equality and democracy and things like that is actually an aberration. So it is not in the human nature to do things collaboratively uh, in in much much other the thing it used to be might have been there in hunter gatherer societies but uh, as the size of societies became larger the, the you know centralized control has been a norm rather than the exception and it's actually the Western world that's an aberration or not China so mm-hmm. China's pretty much doing what comes naturally to human nature that said a lot of people feel that. Once, uh, once the world has tasted uh, democracy and liberty, it's uh, it's 
it's uh, onerous to go back under central control, even if it is well-meaning. So, uh, it's clearly well-meaning. So, these guys are trying to stomp out EdTech. And if you read the uh, situation in China, EdTech is, um, you know, uh, so the China has one IIT, JE kind of exam. Yeah. And your performance when you're 15 years old or something in that exam determines who you become in life. So, you could be a sweeper or you could be the CEO of the next $100 billion company. It all depends on that thing. So, there are like a million Baijus there trying to... Uh, Baidu. Coach, uh, Baidu, okay. <laughs> who, who just sort of, you know, trying to coach people uh, to do well in that exam. So, it's... it's so it's now reduced to doing well in that exam hmm. as opposed to actually learning something. So, yeah. it's clearly not good for society. So, so, sorry, Naren, one second. So, hmm. I mean, the fundamental problem there is the model of the Chinese government which condemns you to exactly. a life at 15 years old, not the ed tech yeah. part. That's exactly. just a fallout of so, the yes, ed tech. This, this is just following so incentives. This is what, hmm. though, yeah. So, this is what appeals to the guy at the top. He all he sees is that I have a system and these guys are gaming it. Let's stomp them up. He's yeah. not at all thinking about what's wrong or uh, you know, and in 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 the free world, everything falls apart on its own because you nobody does anything about it. And if, if you know, you you'd uh, no one would go if you have a centralized exam, a lot of companies would say bullshit, we don't want to hire as per we'll mm. find the you know, we'll find the gems among the yeah. among the coal and we will so Chinese endeavor, according to me, is bound to fail. Uh, how soon is a question is going to fail disastrously. They're just trying to in an increasingly multi-dimensionally complex world, mm -hmm. they're trying to control everything. It is just not possible. Yeah. Human beings cannot be controlled. Yeah. It's yeah. interesting, yeah. like, uh, on that point of ethic uh, and education in general in China, yeah, like you said, that one exam, the, their equivalent to the IIT JE, um, that pretty much determines everything. So, I read somewhere that China is doing this because there are so few skilled people coming out despite all the competition and all that. And to me, there were two, there was a problem with that. Like, then the problem is with the way, like you said, to conduct the exam and all that and not necessarily, you know, uh, yeah, if that's you obvious make, to us, yeah, right? It's, yeah, it's, it's crazy. Just, what yeah. you're going to get is the, the so-called uh, unskilled people are going to come from another demographic. That's the only difference. So instead of all rich people being unskilled, now it's going to be slightly like a more equitable balance of people who are unskilled. Who are unskilled. So yeah, I mean, it's just an excuse for them, I suppose, to clamp down on this. Uh, one argument that I, I read that made sense, because all these tech things and just tutoring in general, online and offline, have become so expensive for the common man to avoid. Chinese are actually avoiding having children because of the yeah. cost of education. So that yeah. kind of makes sense. You make education in general, then it's not about skilling and doing well in the exam. Then it's about the cost of tutoring your kids so that they get by in life. Uh, that argument, I kind of understand, uh, given that China has been trying to get people to have more kids uh, recently and all that. Basically, one big uh, uh, sort of like <laughs> Indian auntie almost. And that is entire thing sounds a, sounds a little familiar to what's happening in India where you have pin all your hopes on one exam and stuff. So uh, it's interesting that you guys are taking this stance because I, when I started off this whole thing, reading about this whole thing, I thought, okay, China's doing something stupid. Then when I started reading a few opinions, I'm like, hmm, okay, there's some merit in some of this. But now you guys have, been, and I thought that after speaking to you guys today that I would be convinced that what they're doing is actually uh, a good thing, but I suppose not. So thank you for uh, <laughs> getting me to trust my yeah. instincts. Another point is that many of these tech companies, they have large foreign holdings. So uh, uh, I think all put together, it is a perfect storm for the Chinese government to sort of make it signal that they are doing something, stand with the common man, whether it's good for the country sector and all that uh, as a whole. And basically get the generation of people now loving the party, saying that, hey, we've got your back and all that uh, more than anything else. Um, I want to end with this one tweet by another Chinese and this was, whose newsletter I actually follow, Lillian Lee. China, the how uh, how industries work in different countries. Uh, China innovate, then regulate. Europe regulate, then don't innovate. The US <laughs> innovate, <laughs> then don't don't regulate. <laughs> I thought that was uh, kind of interesting. So yeah, any other point? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, since we were talking about manufacturing, uh, I have this lovely graph from Bloomberg over here. The day when all this happened, you see the stock prices of all the edtech firms 
crashing. But SMIC, which is a semiconductor trading, a semiconductor manufacturing company, it went up the other way, twenty uh, percent. It's kind of interesting uh, how that's happened. But I don't know. I don't. Do you think that this crackdown? I mean, we could have been handled a little better. I think even if the end goals are admirable, do you think it's actually going to change? Like the other sectors, do you think like the Chinese youth are now suddenly going to want to get into Chinese youth and investors? Do you think they'll want to get into sectors like the like real sectors like manufacturing and all that? My guess is that a lot of people will be scared because what if the Chinese government tomorrow decides, hey, we don't like? I think these chip companies are becoming too big. Let's stamp down on them because at the end of the day, it's worth remembering that many of these e-commerce companies, especially Alibaba, actually became so big because of Chinese government support. So tomorrow they can just change. I mean that to, to me that uncertainty is a big big put off for any entrepreneur in any sector, no matter how aligned to the China's vision they happen to be. Yeah, not just entrepreneurship, right? Even innovation. I mean, it needs a, a culture and yeah. a scalable sort of place to exist. And I mean, basically the signaling is that if you have any kind of original ideas or thoughts or you want to be big, then you know, just get the hell away from. China. Get the hell away from here. Yeah. yeah. Wow. There is another uh, uh, American perspective uh, is that China uh, steals virtually everything from the US and implements mm. it in China. So they have this program where they fund uh, smart kids to go to the. US, study, get master's degrees and things like that, work in industry and oftentimes even settle there. Mm. But they're always controlled by the Politburo. Mm. Like, this is what the Americans say. So I don't know if it's true or not. But there'll always be a father or a mm. parent or a sibling, uh, no siblings, of course, but you know, someone there. And uh, if you don't do the uh, Communist Party's bidding, and oftentimes there will be nothing. So you could go through an entire because you know, if you're in a, in a sector which is not key to the Communist Party, you could just leave. But uh, if you are and the party says you have to report back, you yeah. have to. So yeah. I know someone who works in Google who is totally convinced that uh, China has the entire uh, code base of Google. He's, he told me that there is a Chinese Communist Party group inside Google. They have open meetings and everything like that. They're like, they're officially, officially communist party members. They work, they're all Googlers, they're citizens of America, they're working in the US, but they have meetings and they have discussions. And they well, have. Google's stated mission is to make information free available to everybody. <laughs> so I guess this side of Google. I'm just remembering uh, some Silicon Valley episodes. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, I know. They, I, 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 I guess this was, the, this was the real reason why Don't Be Evil was dropped. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but uh, but no, I mean it's uh, it's it's really interesting how that the point that Tony said about the Chinese culture. I mean, if you look at the evolution of modern Chinese society and infrastructure and industry, it has been one of. I mean, effectively, China has had a fantastic strategy of growth, which is basically to say that we will feed the hunger and greed of the capitalist world. Mm. By, yeah. I mean, communism will provide for the capitalist world in some yeah. way, right? So, uh, where where we, we through our efficiency. But what that did was, I mean, and fundamentally the communist system that works over there is, uh, is one that's geared towards mass production rather than yeah. innovation. And in which case, so the arguments that they make about we need to, uh, instead of, uh, I mean, the, the whole opposition to... Uh, evolution of tech over infrastructure, you can look at it from one perspective and say, okay, Chinese are saying, let's focus, let's redirect focus back to the production rather than these fictional uh, myths versus uh, this thing could also very well simply just be, uh, just be a posturing to move their, move attention back to their strengths. Mm. Right. I mean, they're, they're, it's, it's very simply saying that ha- how about we all stick to, I mean, let let those let those privilege again. I think China is one of those uh, few Asian or uh, developing, relatively developing countries that was actually comfortable with the uh, the status quo of the West innovating and the East supporting it. 
because they became so good at it and they developed their system so uh, radically to support it. Whereas while the rest of the uh, the developing world laments that, oh, innovation is only celebrated in the West and it's not celebrated in the East. China said, okay, fine. We accept the status quo. Here is how we do our job fantastically well. And now, just like in, in some ways, uh, Saudi uh, and the Middle Eastern countries are now struggling with how do we embrace liberal ideals in a more mm. in a way that does not conflict with our traditional radical religious beliefs because we might be soon looking at a world without oil. I think mm. China is trying to do that with the way they uh, handle uh, their education and society. Yeah. Uh, but So, I mean, it, it, we are basically talking about a very short time frame, right? Like yeah. China had like a great famine in the 1950s and then the cultural, I and mean, their opening happened in 1978 or so. It's not like yeah, it was exactly. hundreds of thousands of years ago, right? So at that point in time, it made sense because it did lift a lot of uh, China out of poverty and hunger. But I mean, it's a very short time frame, right? So now when the new thing is happening, we just don't know it is happening. We'll probably know 10 years down the line yeah. that uh, this policy had and had a huge effect on it, right? Yeah. So, I mean, sort of rationalizing everything from the reality of today is a little reductionist in that sense. Yeah, right? and no, that makes perfect sense because China of all countries do look at things in an extremely long term. I think there was some, I think the China, I think the Politburo or somebody over there themselves said America thinks about everything in four year cycles, which they sort of uh, have to, but we always take like a 20, 30 year view of things. So even though this might seem very sudden, uh, yeah, uh, they probably think, I mean, they're smart, uh, I think, and maybe they have some... But really, mind. the last time you had a megalomaniac, he really drove the country yeah, down fair, a hole. Fair. That's, that's fair, yeah, that's fair, so, yeah. 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 So megalomaniacs are generally not good news for a country. <laughs> yeah. You might has, be lucky. It's like, you know, it's like traffic, right? We are, we are driving yeah. in traffic and uh, there's a lot of traffic and there are like, you know, like in Bombay, there are seven lanes and everyone's wriggling and you decide that you want to be in the rightmost one and your wife says, no, keep the middle lane. And you say, no, no, I know better. And then mm. the right lane just doesn't move and the, the middle lane keeps moving. It's just dumb luck. So, uh, oftentimes, uh, world leaders are just like that. They're, they're yeah, fair enough. The right lane are. not moving is actually a fantastic allegory to a lot of <laughs> politics right now, but let's leave it at that. Uh, I think that's really about it. I think we'll have to see how this uh, plays out. Um, if I was an investor or an entrepreneur in any sector, irrespective of what it was, whether it has the graces of the Chinese government today, that might not be the case tomorrow. So, I be very very overall so it looks like my original gut instinct was actually uh, sort of right validated by three very smart people uh, on this show with me uh, so thank you for that I suppose so for now it looks like uh, the big players in the same sectors that have been cracked down in China in, but now in other parts of the world they're going to have a field day so I'm no doubt that all the investment that are supposed to go towards tech in China is now going to come towards say uh, a Baijus in India or something. So that's an opportunity, I guess, yeah. maybe not the, uh, uh, maybe an artificially won victory, but for, I guess it's something that, it's a, it's an opportunity that's fallen on their lap and I guess they can run with it. So I would not be surprised at all if Baijus becomes the dominant edtech brand globally in a couple of years uh, with the graces of uh, of VC firms. So yeah, well, that I think a lot of interesting things to happen if you follow the space of technology as, and like the intersection of technology with politics, then this is a fascinating battle to watch. Any parting comments, folks? This has actually been a reasonably cerebral episode. So, <laughs> we have to bring it down a notch a little. We started with a Kushwan Singh level joke and then took it up to Wall Street Journal uh, editorials. So, we need to maintain balance. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, just that the model is not unsustainable, right? And China will continue to do what China does. And the model is can. not unsustainable. Yeah, or, I mean, no. so like you said, China takes a long-term view. So ah, they're yeah. fairly confident that they can, you know, crush these and still have yeah. their sort of, you know, model intact, right? Yeah, have like, their model and eat it too. We yeah. also exist in a time when North Korea is still there, right? <laughs> and, and one crazy fact about North Korea that I heard was the North Korean internet has about 83 sites that you can access. 
and GTA 5 has a browser which you can access more sites directly. So, <laughs> you really yeah. need more than 83 is. I, I prefer to think of North Korean internet as curation. Like, rather than... Yeah. 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 <laughs> no, no. I think, I, I, be, Tony, I, I was know, joking. Tony, yeah, when, when, no. when, when Tony when has cast. Curation is better has, than prevention. Tony has spent the last six months in Kerala and I think he's, uh, he's come back uh, like... Yeah, uh, yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> no, no, I was joking, Tony. I was joking. Curate on internet brought to you by the North Korean government. Nice. It has yeah. a ring to it, actually. <laughs> when, you, when you pitch it that way, it sounds like they're yeah. actually doing you a favor. We have yeah. sat through all the sites and these are the 81 that uh, you will uh, <laughs> use the most. Interesting. Mm. Any? Okay, I think uh, we should end this episode now. Uh, so yeah. I think yeah. we have spoken enough. And there's no doubt that by the time this episode releases, uh, China might have cracked down on a couple of other industries as well. So it will be kind of uh, interesting to see what happens over there. They might crack down on the condom industry the way they want uh, uh, yeah. people to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, or they may very well have like cracked that. down on this podcast. In this uh, case, CSA to all our Chinese listeners. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Naren? Yeah. So yeah. Stay uh, safe. Stay, stay regulated. Stay safe. Unregulated. Stay, uh, uh, attacked. No. Uh, unregulated. Stay, uh, unregulated. Stay yeah, unregulated. Stay unregulated. Stay uncurated. Yes. Stay uncurated. Stay, 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 stay uncurated and stay simple. I have no yes. idea what that means. But see you guys <laughs> next week. Bye bye. Hi everybody, just wanted to ask everyone for a quick favor. We're running a brand survey right now and would really appreciate it if you could let us know what you think about the advertising on IVM. Go to ivmpodcast.com slash survey and do let us know. As part of this, we'll be selecting 10 random participants and sending them some IVM swag. So do fill out those surveys. Namaste, this is Cyrus Brocha. I am part of the government cancel culture program to remove rubbish off all the different streams available. So what we have is all the collected rubbish we put together on our show. It's called Cyrus Says. It's on IVM podcast. You have to watch it and listen to it. It's on our app. It's on our website. It's on the YouTube channel. It's on Facebook. There are many different ways. Don't bother me and ask me how. Uh, you have to find out. We talk to different personalities. Many of them are known. Some are just people we meet downstairs and invite them up for chai. But the point is, it's fun and it's very therapeutic. So please join in and listen to Cyrus Says. Whether you're an established sports person or a budding one or simply a sports enthusiast, join us, Tanvi and Shlok. We are two passionate pro badminton players talking policy, mindset and everything sport. So tune in to the Millennial Athlete every Monday. Only on the IVM Podcast Network. Trust us, it's gonna be lit.